the Word of God. Just follow along in your Bible. I will read selected passages beginning in chapter 2, verse 7. So let's read this one together since it's one of our verses that we're memorizing. All right, let's read. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now skipping to verse 16, and I shall read, and you just follow on silently. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And then moving into chapter 3, we read these verses last week, and we'll not read all of them, but beginning in verse 8, chapter 3. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the tree, amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And verse 15 is commonly recognized by all Christian scholarship and leadership as being the first promise of the coming of Christ. Number 16, And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all of the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and unto his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin, and clothe them. Verse 21 is highly symbolical of God's provision of our spiritual covering, which required the shedding of blood, just as the physical covering required the shedding of blood. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he, be put, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Thank you. Please be seated. We've been talking about the doctrine of man, and nothing is more basic to the direction, the practical direction of everyday life than uh, what we believe or disbelieve about what is a man, what constitutes a human being. Um, unless we have a clear-cut understanding of God's purpose and doctrine concerning the nature of a human being, 
our lives will not be affected in such a direction that we will be able to live in the right frame of reference with God and with our fellow man. So it's extremely important that we come down hard on the Christian teaching concerning what is a human being, what is a man. And we emphasize that, number one, man is a created being. He's not the result of a mere accident of nature, a spark of lightning coming into some glob of chemicals, and life begins in a small form and then evolves to the greater. No, sir. The Bible teaches, and I believe, that man is a direct creation of God. And then secondly, that this creature that was made in God's likeness is a fallen creature. And I, I think this, that we see every time we see it on television, I've fallen and I can't get up. Here is a beautiful picture of the awful estate in which man finds himself. He has fallen and he cannot get up on his own, no matter how hard he tries. He is a sinner. Now, it's important for us to know that so that we can deal constructively with our nature, so that we can cope in the right way. We need to understand that no matter if you put a person in the White House or if you put him in the governor's mansion or in the mayor's seat, you put him, elect him as a judge, you put the microscope on him, you won't have to look very long to find out he or she is a sinner because all of us are sinners. Point three, and that is that man, a creature of God, fallen, though he be, is yet accountable to God. He cannot simply say, the woman that you gave me, or the woman cannot simply say, the serpent made me, because God said in advance, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So we need to understand that man is accountable to God, and I want us to elaborate on that and enlarge upon that tonight concerning man's accountability. If man is not accountable to God for his sins, if man is not accountable to God for his misdeeds, if man is not guilty for his wickedness, if he does not have a God with whom to do and a God whom he shall face, then why not let him do what feels good? Why not let him just minister to his own needs and ignore everybody else? Who wouldn't? If he could get by with it, or if she could get by with it. Accountability is a, an extremely important item in helping human beings be what God intended us to be in his sight and also in our relationship with one another. Or else we just do our own thing and go our own way and wonder why things are in such a mess fact of accountability and then the warning of accountability and the experience of accountability as it relates to everyday life. The fact of accountability. We have been given a spiel about evolution that most of, it seems, that most of the educational world has swallowed hook, line, and, and sinker without a whole lot of question. It's interesting when people nowadays come to the Word of God and God says that the serpent said to the woman, we can make that serpent look ridiculous and make all kinds of jokes about it and ridicule the Word of God. But when a scientist comes along and says, I found uh, uh, some bone fractures, some fossil fractures here in Sussex, England, in 1911, a man by the name of Charles Dawson, that the whole scientific world named that the Piltdown Man. That's where it was found at Piltdown in Sussex, England. For over 40 years, the scientific world believed that that skeleton was 100,000 to 500,000 years old. And it took the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., examining, finally examining the bone fragments, which was a jawbone and a tooth, and discovered that the man perpetrated a hoax, that it was nothing more than the jawbone and a tooth of a modern ape and he had shaped that thing and worked with it to perpetrate a hoax concerning some uh, assumed fossil of a antiquity. Now, I do not say that all fossils fall in that same category, but I do say here we have one clear-cut evidence of the scientific world biting something, gulping it down because it went along with their presupposition. Now, 
God has said that man is a created being. If he is merely an educated, evolved ape with no God with whom he has to do, it makes all the difference in the world in his actions and in his eternal destiny. Man is created by God. We don't know when he was created. The Bible just says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, uh, Bishop Lightfoot followed the line of Usher in the dating of the creation. And Bishop Lightfoot, many years ago, came out and said, uh, he was the vice chancellor of Cambridge University, he dated the creation of the universe. And he said it was created in the week of October the 18th through the 22nd in the year 4004 B.C. And that man was created at 9 o'clock on October the 23rd uh, a.m. 45th meridian time. Now, this has been looked at sort of humorously by many educators. I don't know if it was, if it was 4004. Francis, I wasn't around then. I know you think I'm a little bit older, but you're catching up with me. <laughs> little inside family joke there. But really, I, I, I'd, I'd rather be skeptical of B.C. And that man was created at 9 o'clock on October the 23rd, uh, a.m., 45th meridian time. Now, this has been looked at sort of humorously by many educators. I don't know if it was, if it was 4004. Francis, I wasn't around then. I know you think I'm a little bit older, but you're catching up with me. <laughs> little inside family joke there. But really, I, I, I'd, I'd rather be skeptical about things. Now, if you are a good enough scientist that you know carbon-14 dating and you personally have investigated that, and you can believe that and still maintain your faith in Christ, and I'm not going to knock you. I don't know enough about science, but I know enough about the Scripture to be skeptical about science. And uh, so I just know that according to the Scripture, God teaches that man is accountable and that he cannot simply hide behind the fact that uh, the devil made me do it or the woman made me do it, but that God in His Word who made us has given us prescriptions and proscriptions he has said thou shalt and thou shalt not and that's his prerogative as God and that implies because he can do that that we've got to respond to him we have a responsibility and we have to stand before him whether we like it or not we can run but we can't hide we can we can try to put fig leaves around ourselves but he can still see us and so man is accountable and really that is our hope Instead of it being merely a threat, it is indeed a hope. But notice not only the fact of accountability, but the experience of accountability. It actually begins now in this life, warning us about that ultimate accountability that is awesome in judgment. God mercifully lets his, uh, his judgment concerning our accountability begin in this present life, even though it is extremely unpleasant and, uh, and heart-rending he lets it begin in this life. I think he lets it begin to humble us and to make us where he might approach us. And yet the anxiety, the fear, the heartache that comes along because of sin in our life and because of sins in other people's lives that we have nothing to do with, it has a cumulative effect. And it's a, it's a, it's a heart-rending experience that God allows to come our way. One night... I received a telephone call in the middle of the night, and this was many years ago. It happened in a family that nobody here would know. And the woman was all broken up. She said her husband had had heart surgery, open heart surgery. And when he came back uh, from the recovery room, uh, while he was in recovery, anyway, he came back from surgery. And she said, Pastor, said, my husband said to me, he said, during surgery, I saw the gates of hell open unto me. And she said, he said, my life will never be the same. And she said, Pastor, we went back to his room, and when the doctor came in, he said to the doctor, now this man was not, even though they were church members, they were wayward church members, she said. The doctor came in, the woman told me on the telephone, she said, Pastor, when the doctor came in, she said, he said, Doctor, I saw the gates of hell open unto me, and my life will never be the same. And she said, uh, Pastor, when the nurses came in, he told the nurses, 
I saw the gates of hell open unto me. And my life will never be the same. She said, Pastor, what do you think? And here I am, it's the middle of the night, and my heart's beating like this, and here I'm trying to give one of my church members encouragement. And she said, What do you think, Pastor? And I said, I think he saw the gates of hell open unto him. And I hope his life will never be the same. Now, God mercifully, this man needed to see the gates of hell. I'm not at all sure that he was saved, even though we had accepted him. We accept people on the basis of what they say. He didn't act like a Christian. He didn't like the things that Christians like. He was a nice fellow. I mean, you know, a lot of people, uh, even grotesque sinners, have some nice qualities. He was, he, he was, uh, they were pleasant people. They just didn't love the things that Jesus loved. And uh, so after this crisis passed and the man got over it, uh, it I, I saw no changes since then we've lost contact with these people. What I'm saying, the experience of accountability begins right now in this life, where God allows judgment to begin uh, to uh, take place in such a way that we know that we are accountable to God. Um, then there is the warning aspect. The fact that we have fallen, we are accountable to God. So what does this mean? This means that we're, we're going to die. In fact, God said that when you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now here they ate of it, but they didn't die physically. Perhaps they thought they pulled one over on God because maybe they didn't know what death was. And I think this is so often the experience of people who are, maybe they're brought up in church and they're told by pa the pastor of the evils of alcoholic beverage or they're told about the evils of gambling. And lo and behold, they go with their group and they go do these things and amazingly, they don't die. They don't, they don't become insane. They don't lose all their friends. They've enjoyed it. Our pastor didn't know what he was talking about, you see. And so, they, just like Adam and Eve, when, when they sinned, they didn't die like they thought no, nothing real bad happened except they were just a little frightened about God. You see. They didn't want to be close to God. They didn't want to go to church like they did before. They didn't want to read the Bible like they did before, you see. But they were okay, you see. They were all right. They just needed some clothes on you see, they didn't know exactly why, except that they were afraid. It wasn't because they were cold. Now listen, God in His mercy has given us a warning because we are His creatures and are fallen. This warning has two sides to it. He put at the entrance of that garden as He drove man and woman out a flaming sword. And that sword has two sides. It's a flaming sword turning every way. And one side is judgment for those who refuse to repent. The other side is a sword that brings deliverance from evil and salvation. That's why the sword is flaming and it's held up by cherubim pointing people to the way. It is God mercifully warning us who are accountable that we can be saved if we're willing to receive His salvation. You know there are 234 warnings in the New Testament concerning eternal punishment. And anybody, if they were on a highway out here and they saw 234 signs saying this highway leads to hell, they ought to get off of that highway and get on the one that's not going to hell. God in His mercy has put 234 road signs in the New Testament saying don't go the road that leads to hell. I heard about a little girl came in and talked to her daddy, came in from Sunday school and church one day and Daddy was not saved, and she was burdened about her daddy. And she said, Daddy, are you going to heaven when you die? And he was angry. He said, what do you mean? Who put you up to this, your mother or your aunt? He said, I'm going whichever way I want to go. He said, Daddy, which way are you going? It's good for us to ask ourselves which way are we going. You know, people make a mockery, but the Bible says fools make a mock of sin. I often think about that when I'm watching Johnny Carson and Arsenio Hall and uh, some of the other popular comics, and they say a lot of cute, interesting things and humorous things. 
but they also make a mockery of sin. You know, it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to take something sacred and make it look ridiculous. And I know we, we need a sense of humor. That's why I try to keep y'all laughing every now and then, because y'all need a better sense of humor. But, <laughs> but, uh, but really, the Bible, we ought never to make light of that which God takes very, very seriously. And fools make a mock of sin. I remember back in, uh, in 1969 when the Hurricane Camille hit the Mississippi coast, there was a group of young adults having a hurricane party. And that hurricane was bearing down on the Mississippi coast. And a civil defense worker went to that house on the beach, and he told those young adults to get out of that. An awful hurricane was coming, and they mocked that man. They made fun of that man. When that storm hit, on August the 17th, 1969, 23 persons died because they refused to heed the warning. Now listen, God in his mercy has given us a warning. I remember one day I was visiting a man in a trailer park on Chef Highway. His name was Mr. White. I visited with him several other times. He refused to talk to me. He didn't have time to talk to me. He didn't have time for the church. He didn't have time for God. And I went to witness to him. I had known him through his daughter. And... Um, so one day as I went up and, uh, and saw him, he said, I don't have time for that. I've got to go drive my truck. He was a truck driver. And um, I said, uh, as he was leaving, I said, Mr. White, I said, if you on this trip you take, suppose that truck has an accident and you're killed. I said, where are you going? He said, I don't have time for that. And he went on. I had uh, visited with him a number of times. I knew that that was coming on awfully strong, but I knew that that might be my last chance, and I really pressed home the question. I lost contact with the man. I found out that about a year later, he died at the ripe old age of 33 from a mysterious blow to the head. As far as I know, this man uh, died without Christ. I hope, you know, in the time that I didn't know him, that he found the Lord. But so far as I know, he died without Christ. Somebody said, uh, suppose you Christians... Um, you, you receive the Lord Jesus, you say, and you, you, you start trying to serve him, and you resist temptation, and you don't go out and drink with others, and you don't go out and commit immoral acts, you restrain yourself, you pass up all the parties, and you live all of your life, and you die, and lo and behold, there isn't any God, and there isn't any afterlife, and that's it. Christian hearing that argument said, listen, if I am saved at an early age and I don't get drunk and I don't commit immoral acts and I restrain myself and I try to live a Christian life and I die and there isn't any God and there isn't any hell or heaven, I will not have missed anything. But here you are living the way you want to live, drinking, partying, immoral life, resisting God, and you say there isn't any God, suppose you die and there is God in heaven and hell. You will have lost everything. Man is made accountable to God. Man is accountable to God. Um, when a young minister was confronted with a skeptic's comments at the close of his service, the skeptic was named Bert Olman. And uh, the skeptic, uh, sort of sophisticated guy, said, you did a pretty good job with your sermon today, but said, I, I disagree with it because I don't believe in the infallibility of the Bible. Well, the preacher said, well, sir, he said, the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment. Well, he said, um, you can't prove to me there's anything as judgment after death. But the young pastor said, but men do die. And the Bible says it is appointed on the man once to die. And after that, the judgment. And the skeptic, Bert only said, but that is no argument. Uh, let's get down to business and let's discuss this and have a rational argument about it. The pastor shook his head and said, I'm here to preach the word of God, and I'm not here to argue. And the word of God says, it is appointed unto man once to die, but after that, that the judgment. 
And uh, Olney said, I do not believe you know enough about the Bible to argue. And the preacher said, I may not know enough about the Bible to argue, but this I do know. The Bible says it is appointed on the man once to die, but after that, the judgment. So Bert Olney left angry, and it was night, and on his way home, he walked by a pond, and the frogs were in that pond croaking, and every time a, a frog croaked, it sounded like they were saying, judgment, judgment. Judgment, judgment. And all night long, Bert Olney heard, but after that, the judgment. But after that, the judgment. The next morning, he called the Parsons. That's where a preacher used to live. Parsons. I've come to see you, he said, about that verse of Scripture you kept quoting last night. I cannot rid my mind of them. Tell me what must I do to be saved. I've got to get rid of this culture. Isn't it true that God in His mercy has given us warning concerning man's accountability? Listen. A husband was disgusted with his wife's long-haired cat. The thing jumped on all the furniture, got hair all over everything. It jumped in your lap when you didn't want it. He was so thoroughly disgusted that he tied a rope around that cat's neck and threw it in the river and drowned it. Of course, his wife didn't know what happened to her cat. So for days and days she moaned and wept until finally he agreed to try to find the cat. And he ran an ad in the paper and offered a $1,000 reward to anybody that could help him find his wife's lost cat. And one of his friends said, isn't that a large reward to offer for a cat? He says it is, but when... You know what you know, it's worth taking the risk. And I want to tell you, when you know the Word of God and God's teaching concerning the nature of man and that man is accountable to God, to God with whom he has to do, it's worth taking the risk to place your whole life, your decisions, your future, your will, everything you have in God's hands. And Calvin Coolidge was vice president and president of the Senate. There was an awful argument that took place between two of the senators, and one of them became so angry he told the other senator, he said, you can just go straight to hell. The other senator was so infuriated, he got up out of his seat and walked towards the desk where President Coolidge was sitting, and he said, did you hear what he said to me? And Coolidge very calmly uh, looked down at a book and still leaping through a book of rules, he said, I've looked through the rule book and you do not have to go. And isn't it wonderful that Man is accountable to God, but when we look through his rule book, the Holy Bible, we find that even though we deserve hell and death and separation from God because of Jesus, praise God, we do not have to go. We do not have to go. Somebody has said it this way, when the great busy plants of our cities shall have turned out their last finished work, when the merchants have sold their last order and dismissed every last hired clerk, when our banks have raked in their last dollar and have paid out their last dividend, when the judge of the earth wants a hearing and asks for a balance, what then? What then? Tonight, as we have our invitation, you may need to decide for Jesus, and I'll be here to counsel you and encourage you and have prayer with you. Stand together.